Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information. Good morning, Farida. I'm Dr. Gideon. How are you feeling today? Good morning. I'm feeling a little better, but still in pain. I see. Can you please tell me your full name and your age? My name is Farida Abdul, and I am 42 years old. Thank you, Farida. Can you please tell me your address and the type of residence you live in? I live at 9 Carlton Terrace, Dublin, Ireland in a house. Great, Farida. Can you please tell me about your closest relatives? I have a husband, Muhammad Abdul, who is a software engineer. I also have a daughter, Fatima Abdul, who is a student and a brother, Fahim Abdul, who is a shop owner. Thank you, Farida. Can you tell me the reason for coming to the hospital today? I have been experiencing abdominal pain and nausea. I understand. Do you have any past medical history or a family history of any illnesses? No, I don't have any past medical history or a family history of any illnesses. Okay. Can you tell me about your social history? Are you a smoker or a drinker? I am a married homemaker, non-smoker, and an occasional drinker. Okay. Have you ever used any recreational drugs? No, I haven't. Have you got any allergies? No, I haven't. Can you tell me about your dietary habits? I have a normal diet and I am not a vegetarian. What medications were you taking before coming to the hospital? I was taking paracetamol 500 mg for pain relief, two tablets every four hours, and omeprazole 20 mg for acid reflux, one tablet daily. I see. Your vital signs show that your blood pressure is 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury, your heart rate is 70 BPM, your respiratory rate is 18 breaths per minute, and your body temperature is 36.8 degrees Celsius. Our assessment shows that you have abdominal pain in the right upper quadrant, nausea and vomiting, and tenderness and guarding on abdominal examination. Based on these findings, our diagnosis is that you require a gallbladder removal. We will need to perform an abdominal ultrasound and some blood tests regarding liver function tests for further investigations. Our nursing management for you includes nil per oral status before the surgery, pain management with intravenous analgesics, monitoring of vital signs and fluid balance, and antibiotic prophylaxis before surgery. After the surgery, you will be given morphine sulfate injection 2.5 mg every 4 hours for pain relief and metronidazole 500 mg, two tablets twice a day for 7 days for infection prophylaxis. Our discharge plan for you includes a review with the surgeon after 7 days, continuing pain management with oral analgesics, a follow-up with your GP in 4 weeks for wound check and removal of sutures, and following a low-fat diet for 2 weeks post-surgery. Thank you, doctor. That's very clear. Can you please explain the surgery and the recovery process? Of course, Farida. The surgery is called cholecystectomy and it involves the removal of the gallbladder. The recovery process usually takes a few weeks, during which time you may experience some pain and discomfort. It is important to follow the instructions given by your surgeon, including taking pain medication as prescribed, avoiding heavy lifting or strenuous activity, and following a low-fat diet for a few weeks after the surgery. You may also need to attend follow-up appointments with your surgeon to monitor your progress and ensure that you are healing properly. It is also important to monitor for any signs of infection or complications and to contact your doctor if you experience any concerning symptoms. Overall, the recovery process can be challenging, 
but with proper care and attention, you should make a full recovery. Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase that you hear. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, Mr. Leifa. My name is Ilsa. I am a neurologist here at the hospital. Can you tell me about yourself and what brings you to see us today? Good morning, Dr. Elsa. I am 33 years old and I live at 36 Station Street, Dublin, Ireland. I have an apartment in Dublin city centre. Thank you, Mr. Leifa. Can you tell me a bit about your closest relatives? Sure. My mother's name is Maria and she is a housewife. My father's name is Olafur and he is retired. I also have a sister, Lilja, who is a primary school teacher. I see. Can you tell me what brought you to the hospital today? Yes, I have been experiencing frequent and recurrent seizures and I wanted to get them checked out. I understand. Can you tell me a bit about your past medical history? Sure, I have a history of migraine headaches and I have previously been diagnosed with depression for which I was receiving medication. How about your family medical history? Is there any history of neurological or psychiatric illnesses in your family? No, there is no significant history of those illnesses in my family. Okay. Can you tell me about your social history? Are you married or do you have any children? No, I am single and live alone. I am a non-smoker and drink alcohol occasionally. There is no history of recreational drug use. Thank you, Mr. Leifa. Can you tell me about your employment? I am employed as a software engineer. I see. Are you allergic to any medications or substances? No, I don't have any known allergies. How about your dietary habits? Do you have any restrictions or special requirements? No, I have a balanced diet with no restrictions. Can you tell me about the medications you were taking before you were admitted to the hospital? Yes, I was taking escitalopram 10 mg, 1 tablet daily and paracetamol 500 mg, 1 to 2 tablets as needed for headache. Thank you, Mr. Leifa. Your vital signs taken when you were admitted show that your blood pressure was 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury, heart rate was 72 beats per minute, respiratory rate was 18 breaths per minute, oxygen saturation was 98%, and body temperature was 36.8 degrees Celsius. Based on the history you provided and the investigations ordered, I have diagnosed you with epilepsy. I have ordered an electroencephalogram and a magnetic resonance imaging of the brain for further evaluation. Okay, I understand. Our nursing management for you will include administering anti-epileptic medication as prescribed, monitoring vital signs and seizure activity, providing education on epilepsy management and self-care, and encouraging adherence to medication and follow-up appointments. The medication prescribed for you is levetiracetam 1000 mg, two tablets twice daily. Okay, thank you. For your discharge plan, we advise you to continue taking the medication as prescribed, attend a follow-up appointment with a neurologist in two weeks, and encourage lifestyle changes such as regular exercise and stress management. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. 
Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a conversation in which an optometrist talking to a patient with Axenfeld-Rieger syndrome. Now read the question. Good morning. How can I help you today? Good morning. I have a rare eye defect and I need to know more about it. Of course. What kind of eye defect are you referring to? I was told that I have a condition called Axenfeld-Rieger syndrome. Ah, yes. Axenfeld-Rieger syndrome is a rare genetic disorder that affects the eyes and the development of certain structures in the front part of the eye. I have seen a few cases of this before and I am familiar with the condition. Can you tell me more about your symptoms? Yes, I have been experiencing blurred vision and sensitivity to light. I also have a visible iris process and a displaced pupil. I see. Those are common symptoms of Axenfeld-Rieger syndrome. I would like to examine your eyes more closely to get a better understanding of your condition. Can you follow my finger with your eyes, please? Sure. Well, it appears that you have moderate Axenfeld-Rieger syndrome. This means that your iris is thicker than usual, and the angle between the iris and cornea is wider than normal. What does this mean for my vision? It can cause nearsightedness, farsightedness, and astigmatism, which can result in blurred vision. Additionally, the iris processes can also cause glare and halos around lights, especially at night. Is there anything that can be done to treat this? Unfortunately, there is no cure for Axenfeld-Rieger syndrome. However, there are ways to manage the symptoms and improve your vision. For example, I can prescribe glasses or contact lenses to help you see more clearly. In some cases, surgery may be necessary to correct certain aspects of the eye. Thank you for explaining everything to me. I appreciate your help. Of course. I am always here to help. If you have any further questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to ask. Now look at question 26. You hear a morning briefing in a hospital rehabilitation ward given by a nurse in charge. Now read the question. Good morning everyone and welcome to our daily morning briefing. I hope you all had a good night's rest, today we have 12 patients in our rehabilitation ward and I would like to go over some important information for each of them. Patient 1, Mrs. Smith, was admitted to the ward yesterday for physical therapy. She is recovering from a hip replacement surgery and will be starting her therapy sessions today. Patient 2, Mr. Johnson was admitted to the ward last week for speech therapy. He had a stroke and is working on regaining his speech and language skills. Patient 3, Ms. Patel was admitted to the ward two weeks ago for occupational therapy. She had a hand injury and is working on regaining dexterity in her handy, would like to remind everyone that there will be a guest speaker from the American Physical Therapy Association visiting us today to give a presentation on the latest techniques and technology in rehabilitation therapy. I would also like to emphasize the importance of maintaining a clean and safe environment for our patients. Please make sure to follow proper infection control procedures and to report any incidents or accidents immediately. Is there any other business that needs to be discussed before we start our day? All right, if there is nothing else, let's start our day and make sure to provide the best care and therapy for our patients. Thank you, everyone.
Now look at question 27. You hear a conversation in which a doctor talking to a patient experiencing some discomfort in your chest and arms. Now read the question. Good morning, Mrs. Smith. How are you feeling today? Good morning, doctor. I'm feeling a bit better, thank you. That's great to hear. I understand that you have been experiencing some discomfort in your chest and arms. Can you tell me more about your symptoms? Yes, doctor. I've been having a tight feeling in my chest and sometimes a tingling sensation in my arms. It's been happening quite frequently lately. I see. And have you been experiencing any other symptoms such as shortness of breath or rapid heartbeat? Yes, I have. And sometimes I even feel lightheaded and dizzy. I understand. Based on your symptoms, it sounds like you may have angina. Angina is a condition that causes chest pain or discomfort when there is not enough blood flow to your heart muscle. Oh no. Is it serious, doctor? It can be, but it can also be managed with the right treatment. I would like to run some tests to confirm the diagnosis and determine the best course of action for you. Okay, doctor. I trust your judgment. Great. I will arrange for some tests to be done and we will go over the results together. In the meantime, I would advise you to avoid any physical activity that may trigger your angina symptoms and to make any necessary lifestyle changes to manage your condition. Thank you, doctor. I appreciate your help. Of course, Mrs. Smith. I am here to help you and ensure that you receive the best care possible. Let's work together to manage your condition and improve your quality of life. Now look at question 28. You hear a conversation in which a pharmacist talking to a customer about a generic drug called atorvastatin. Now read the question. Good morning. How may I help you today? Hi, I have a prescription for a medication, but I want to know if there is a generic version available. Of course. What is the name of the medication? It's called Lipitor. Lipitor is a brand name medication used to lower cholesterol levels. Yes, there is a generic version available, which is called Atorvastatin. How does the generic compare to the brand name version? The generic version is the same as the brand name version in terms of dose, quality, and intended use. The only difference is that the generic version is sold under its chemical name, rather than its brand name, and it is typically much less expensive. Is it as effective as the brand name medication? Absolutely, the generic version is just as effective as the brand name medication. In fact, it has the same active ingredient, so it works in exactly the same way. The generic versions of medications have to meet the same standards of quality, safety, and efficacy as the brand name versions. That's great, I'll go with the generic then. Great choice. If you have any further questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you. That was very helpful. Now look at question 29. You hear a doctor briefing patient about surgery. Now read the question. Good morning, Mr. Smith. I'm Dr. Johnson, the lead surgeon on your case. I wanted to take a few minutes to talk with you today about your condition and the upcoming procedure. 
Good morning, doctor. I appreciate you taking the time to see me today. Of course. So, as you may know, you have a rare condition that requires surgery. Your case is unique and it's important for us to make sure you understand everything that's going to happen. Can you tell me a little bit about what you already know about your condition? I have been told that I have a growth that needs to be removed, but I don't have many details beyond that. Yes, that's correct. You have a growth that has developed in your abdominal area and it needs to be removed as soon as possible. The growth is not cancerous, but it is causing some discomfort and could potentially cause other problems if left untreated. Okay, I understand. What's the procedure going to involve? The procedure is going to be a laparoscopic surgery, which means we'll make several small incisions in your abdomen rather than a single large one. We'll then use specialized instruments to remove the growth. The surgery is minimally invasive, so you should experience less pain and a faster recovery time compared to traditional surgery. That sounds good. How long will the procedure take and will I have to stay in the hospital for a long time? The surgery should take about 2 hours and we expect you to be able to go home in 3 to 4 days. Of course, we'll be monitoring your progress closely and we may adjust the timeline if necessary. That's great. Is there anything I need to do to prepare for the surgery? Yes, there are a few things you'll need to do in the days leading up to the surgery. We'll provide you with a list of instructions, but some of the main things include avoiding certain medications, not eating or drinking anything after midnight the night before the surgery, and making sure someone is available to drive you home after the procedure. Okay, I understand. Is there anything else I should know? That's all the information I have for now. If you have any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to ask. We're here to make sure you have the best possible outcome, and we'll do everything we can to make that happen. Thank you, doctor. I appreciate your help, and I'm looking forward to getting this taken care of. You're welcome, Mr. Smith. We'll see you on the day of the surgery. Good luck and take care. Now look at question 30. You hear a conversation in which two dietitians are talking about a new technology called Smart Plate. Now read the question. Hey, have you heard about the new technology called Smart Plate? It's a plate that analyzes the food you put on it and provides you with the exact nutritional information. Wow, that sounds amazing. How does it work? Well, it uses cameras and sensors to detect the type and amount of food on the plate. Then it uses machine learning algorithms to identify the food and calculate its nutritional content. That's incredible. This could really help our clients better understand their diets and make healthier choices. Absolutely. And the best part is that it's really easy to use. All you have to do is place your food on the plate, and the smart plate does the rest. You can even connect it to your smartphone and track your progress over time. That's amazing. I can see this technology becoming very popular in our field. I think it would be great to recommend it to our clients who are looking to improve their diets and overall health. Definitely. I think we should both look into getting certified in using the smart plate so that we can offer it to our clients. It's going to be a game changer in our field. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. 
Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract one. Hi, Daniel. Today, we're going to talk about the topic of brainwashing. Can you start by explaining where the term came from? Sure, Sana. The term brainwashing was actually coined in 1950 and it appeared on both sides of the Atlantic. The person credited with popularizing it was Edward Hunter, a journalist who had worked in wartime intelligence. He wrote an article about a new idea of brainwashing, which was meant to be a translation of a Chinese term for cleansing the mind. Hunter was warning people about Maoism and communism and the idea that new techniques had emerged that could be used to manipulate the minds of the masses. It was part of the early Cold War fear of communism and particularly what was happening in China. The idea of thought reform or thought control and how dangerous it could be. That's interesting. So, the term brainwashing was used to spread fear of communism. Exactly. It became a political football and there were a spate of articles, books and films that used the term to warn people about the dangers of communism and thought control. That makes sense with the backdrop of the post-war interest in denazification and anxieties about communism in the Soviet Union. Absolutely. And with the creation of the People's Republic in China, it really added to the anxieties about communism taking over and spreading throughout the world. It was also part of the early Cold War fear of communism and particularly what was going on in China. And that atmosphere is what made Clarence Adams' decision so controversial. Yes, Clarence was an African-American soldier in the Korean War who became a prisoner of war and was held captive for several years. When he was freed, instead of going back to the US, he chose to move to Mao's China. This choice tapped into the US's worst fears about brainwashing and the pressure to return to the US was intense. That must have been a difficult decision for him, especially given the anti-communist ideology in the US at the time. Absolutely. There was a total hostility to left-wing thinking and witch hunts were happening. But Clarence decided to have an adventure in China, he even married a Chinese woman and had two children. However, as conditions became difficult for Western citizens, he changed his mind and went back to the US. The FBI questioned him but he was not ultimately court-martialed or jailed. Clarence's story wasn't unique. There were other American soldiers who also chose to live in China, but later changed their minds and returned home. That's right. And in my book, I discuss their experiences, including David Hawkins, who was the youngest of the group of 21. He was just 17 when he joined the army and felt like he didn't have much to return to in the US. The term brainwashing was often used during the Cold War, but what exactly is it and is it actually effective? 
well, it was definitely sensationalized during the Cold War. However, if you take someone as a prisoner and put them through extreme conditions, it's possible to do a lot of damage to their mind. The fear was that if someone's identity and sense of self could be so easily shattered, then what could be done with that empty shell of a person once they had been traumatized, humbled, and made to feel guilty through various techniques like sensory deprivation, dress positions, and isolation. So while we need to be cautious about the sensationalization of brainwashing, I don't think there's any doubt about the capacity to destroy someone's mind under certain conditions. Wow, it sounds like a very comprehensive way to control the mind. Yes, it can be quite disturbing. Robert J. Lifton, who is a psychiatrist and historian, wrote a book in 1961 that discussed the similarities between cults and political regimes in terms of how they control people's thoughts. He explains how these so-called brainwashing regimes close down opportunities for dissent and debate by controlling information and limiting access to it. And Hannah Orent also had some thoughts on the subject. Yes, she suggested that some political states can be considered totalitarian, where information is controlled in a way that completely destroys people's ability to know what's true and what's false. It's a total assault on their capacity to discern the truth, and where lying and truth-telling become blurred, leading to total disorientation. So, the idea of brainwashing wasn't just restricted to the East, the West was equally interested in it, right? That's correct. In fact, the concept of brainwashing soon started being applied to the West as well. There had been discussions in the West before the term brainwashing was even coined about mass suggestion and group phenomena. But after the term was first used to describe what was happening in China, people started to question how applicable it was in conditions of relative freedom. And I understand that other terms started to emerge during this time, related to thought control and influence. Yes, that's right. In addition to the term brainwashing, there was also groupthink, which was coined in 1952 by an American business journalist. He was writing about how, in big corporations and bureaucracies, there was a sort of synchronization of behavior and opinion, where people started to become more alike in their attitudes and customs. He was interested in how this was inculcated and how people adapted to the culture of big business. Have you heard of Ernest Dichter, the psychologist? Yes, after the war he set up an institute for motivational research in New York. He promised the advertising industry that he could plumb the depths of people's minds and find out their emotional associations and unconscious meanings towards products. He believed that in order to sell products, companies needed to understand the deeper desires and anxieties of the masses. And then Vance Packard came along in the late 1950s and published a book that shed light on these techniques used in the advertising world. That's right. The book, The Hidden Persuaders, became a bestseller and it was about how the advertising industry was using psychology and behaviorism to manipulate people into buying things or having certain political beliefs. Packard aimed to expose these techniques and warn the reader that they were being influenced without even realizing it. So, in 1957, Dichter and Packard went on the radio to debate about advertising techniques. Right. Dichter believed that there was nothing wrong with giving people information about products, while Packard saw it as dangerous and a form of manipulation. They both had different views on how advertising was affecting people's minds. And how does this all fit in with the idea of brainwashing? It's on a spectrum, from brainwashing at one end to persuasion at the other. This can extend to training in the army, education, and even groupthink. It raises the question of how people can think for themselves and have authentic thoughts. All of these terms are open to interpretation and can mean different things to different people. Ultimately, what's at stake is the spectrum of influence that people are under from teachers, culture, and other people. One person's brainwasher might be another person's freedom fighter. There was a lot of concern about brainwashing and persuasive techniques throughout the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s, so much so that even the Beatles were once accused of brainwashing young people. Can you explain how the term brainwashing went from being associated with war and violence to being applied to a musical group like the Beatles? I think it's part of a larger history of soft power and the impact of culture on shaping people's opinions. In times of war, 
propaganda was used to boost morale, but there's also a growing anxiety about the influence of popular culture, like cartoons, fiction, and music. As pop music became more popular with artists like Elvis and the Beatles, there was a lot of concern about mass hysteria and a sense that people were getting too excited and susceptible to suggestion. When the Beatles started to experiment with more challenging and radical music, right-wing pastors and politicians in the US started to view them as a threat. They warned against the perceived sexual decadence, permissiveness, and even claimed that the Beatles were in some way in service of communism. It's fascinating how music and art can be used as a tool for propaganda and persuasion. Absolutely, the CIA was well aware of this and used it to their advantage. They even funded and promoted jazz musicians and artists like Jackson Pollock to advance their ideology. Really? That's interesting. Can you give me an example of how they did that? Sure. There was a lot of covert funding that went into promoting these artists and musicians, as uncovered in the book, Who Paid the Piper? They were seen as promoting the ideas of freedom and improvisation, which was seen as a challenge to communism. That's wild. I never would have thought that artists like Jackson Pollock were being used for propaganda. Yes, and it wasn't just limited to the US and the Soviet Union. The whole world became a cultural and political battleground for this idea of psychological warfare. And it's not just the CIA that was promoting artists and musicians, the Soviet Union was doing it too. So what happened with Elvis Presley? I remember hearing something about him and the White House. That's right. Elvis was a source of anxiety because of his sexual and orgiastic appeal but he later turned up at the White House to meet President Richard Nixon and wanted to be sworn in as a special agent to deal with the brainwashing of American youth. It was a bizarre turn of events, but it just shows how even celebrities can be drawn into this propaganda war. Was Elvis Presley used by the government in any way? No, I don't think so. President Nixon was told he should meet Presley and there's a photo of their meeting where Presley was given a certificate, but it seemed more like a formality. Nixon was a bit confused about the whole situation, but he was advised to meet Presley. The encounter was quite whimsical. On one hand, the story of brainwashing has a light-hearted element to it, but on the other hand, it can be a serious and ugly story where people are actually suffering. So, the story of brainwashing is complex and ranges from a topic of popular culture to the horrors of detention and torture. What are some of the most concerning examples of brainwashing that we see today? Well, opinions may vary depending on the political views of different commentators, journalists, and politicians. From a liberal and left perspective, I think climate change denial, authoritarian populism, and the rise of new neo-fascist forces are all examples of manipulation. One could argue that liberalism is also quite complacent. In today's world, the dangers of leaders like Bolsonaro, Trump, and new neo-fascist forces are very obvious, as even basic facts are being contested. In the United States, there isn't even a consensus on basic facts like the size of the crowd at a presidential inauguration. The internet can be a tool for information and education, but it can also be used for manipulation through news silos and echo chambers, and even search engines can be gamed. Now look at extract two. Extract two, questions 37 to 42. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42.
In 1994, at 26 years of age, Dennis Wayne Hope was placed in solitary confinement in a Texas prison after he had escaped and remained free for two months. Until he was recently hospitalized, he had been confined to a dark cell not much bigger than a king-size mattress for the past 27 years. In that time, he had been permitted one personal phone call in 2013, after his mother died and had seen virtually no one other than the guards who strip-searched him whenever he was taken, handcuffed, to another room to exercise by himself. According to court documents, he now faces severe depression, paranoid auditory and visual hallucinations, and suicidality. He has written to his lawyers that he fears he may be losing his mind. After an appeals court ruled against Hope's petition to impose limits on solitary confinement as a violation of the Eighth Amendment prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment, the U.S. Supreme Court may soon decide whether the quarter century he has spent subjected to what the United Nations defines as torture merits their attention. If the justices hear his case, it will require remarkable callousness to refuse to acknowledge the cruelty involved in Hope's treatment but the court will be hard-pressed to characterize prolonged subjection to solitary confinement as unusual in America. During ordinary times in the United States, approximately 80,000 people are held in solitary confinement, and more than 10% of them have spent three years or more under these conditions. Solitary confinement has for decades been so routinized that a recent study, for example, showed that 11% of all black men in Pennsylvania born between 1986 and 1989 had been held in solitary confinement by 32 years of age. Nearly all of them endured these conditions for a period of more than 15 days the threshold beyond which well-established international standards characterize solitary confinement as a violation of human rights. During the COVID-19 pandemic, jail and prison administrators have dramatically increased the number of people held in solitary, which had risen to approximately 300,000 by the summer of 2020. As COVID-19 outbreaks continue, solitary is still being widely used as a protective measure. Over the first two years of the pandemic, expanded use of solitary was the default infection control strategy to which officials turned in order to avoid complying with calls for mass decarceration, which was recommended by health and safety experts as the best way to keep incarcerated people safe and to stop jails and prisons from amplifying the pandemic and spreading deadly disease throughout surrounding communities. This policy has not only failed to prevent carceral COVID-19 outbreaks it has also generated a shadow epidemic of psychological and physiological injury that will reverberate for decades to come. For people subjected to torture, the harm doesn't end when the torture technically ends. It haunts them in both body and mind for entire lifetimes. It also haunts their children, parents, partners, families, communities, and countries. It affects their ability to maintain relationships, sleep, make sense of their environments, trust others, hold jobs, make meaning and pleasure in life, and often simply to perform the basic tasks of bodily self-care. When society inflicts severe injury on its members, the burden of caring for people whom society has disabled falls on others. And even if we reject our ethical responsibility to provide care, we are not free from the harm our government has caused in our names. It boomerangs back as chronic disease that overwhelms our already inadequate healthcare system and as high crime rates, widespread distrust, and overburdened welfare systems that continually fail the people they are meant to help. History has shown repeatedly that violence produces more violence, punishment more punishment, and harm more harm. What, then, will be the long-term consequences of the conclusion by leaders in one of the world's wealthiest countries that the best they could do to protect its residents during a pandemic was to subject approximately 300,000 of them to torture? What of the future of the 10 million-plus people who have been held in U.S. jails, prisons, and immigrant detention facilities during the pandemic, a large proportion of whom, even if spared solitary confinement, have been subjected to abusive conditions for an extended period of time. Even without exposure to solitary confinement that compounds harm, incarceration under standard conditions in U.S. jails and prisons shaves years off life expectancy. Already before the COVID-19 pandemic led to an acute worsening of carceral conditions, one study estimated that each year of incarceration shortened a person's future life by two years, Another estimated a loss of nearly five years of life expectancy by age 45.17. The harm also extends to family members of incarcerated people, 
whose life expectancy is 2.6 years shorter than that of peers who have not been separated from siblings, children, fathers, or mothers who have been incarcerated. Moreover, recent studies have underlined that, owing to spillover effects within biosocial networks, high incarceration rates drive substantial increases in mortality for entire counties. The scale of this harm is difficult to overestimate. With more than 2 million people behind bars and roughly 5 million more currently on probation or parole, the U.S. incarceration rate is nearly seven times the average rate in peer countries. More than 70 million U.S. residents have criminal records, and nearly half of all Americans have an immediate family member who has been incarcerated. Given these numbers, how much of the $4.3 trillion in annual U.S. healthcare spending is dedicated to trying to undo the effects of state-sponsored violence to which so many patients have been exposed? How much safer might we all be if, rather than perpetuating failed models of criminal deterrence in policing and incarceration, policymakers invested in violence prevention by means of reparative care for historically dispossessed communities? What are the financial and human costs of continued reliance on tough-on-crime politics despite abundant evidence that mass incarceration directly undermines, rather than improves, collective safety? As a physician, psychoanalyst, and ethnographer, I work with both war veterans and people who have been incarcerated. From my vantage, the long shadow cast by America's wars is the closest parallel to the scale of harm perpetrated by mass incarceration. To mitigate the long-term health effects of the wars from Vietnam to Iraq and Afghanistan, the Department of Veterans Affairs spends more than $300 billion per year to care for veterans, who have considerably higher rates of substance use disorders, severe psychiatric illness, suicide, homelessness, unemployment, and social and economic instability than the general population. The Veterans Affairs system, though imperfect, provides a model for a possible response to the fallout of America's longest-running war the nationally self-destructive war on crime. The ramifications of abuse behind bars bar, like the traumas of war, deeply etched into bodies, minds, and relationships. Undoing the harms caused by incarceration especially in Black, Latinx, and indigenous communities in which poverty has long been met with systematic criminalization rather than support will require large-scale public investments like those that fund the Veterans Affairs system. To this end, rather than continue to allocate approximately $278 billion annually for yet more policing and punishment, the federal government could progressively reallocate and supplement these resources to fund a new U.S. Department of Community Safety and Repair. Its mandate should be to stop and undo the harm done in the name of criminal justice and a police-centric concept of public safety that focuses on crime rates alone while disregarding other statistically far more important determinants of safety such as stable housing, financial security, addiction treatment and overdose prevention systems, labor rights, environmental regulation, and continuous healthcare access. To be successful, this new department would need sustained resources to build infrastructure for community-based care that could replace reliance on police and prisons. In coordination with an expansion of existing public programs that provide housing, basic income, and health care, this caregiving infrastructure should include hands-on assistance that many people, especially formerly incarcerated persons, need in order to establish themselves as valued members of communities. Accordingly, Guided by an ethic of community not as an abstraction but as a practical reality rooted in meeting one another's material needs that has been increasingly eroded from American life, a core of community health and justice workers with an initial target of 2 million workers, or 6 workers per 1,000 residents, could be the backbone of a national project of repair. A public jobs program of this size roughly equivalent to the number of people now incarcerated or half the number employed by the policing, jail, prosecution, and prison industries may at first appear unrealistic. When compared with the 2.6 physicians and 16 nurses per 1,000 people in the United States, however, 2 million community health and justice workers charged with a much broader range of tasks than strictly medical care seems like a modest starting point. In a country with high rates of homelessness, poverty, chronic disease and disability, addiction, elder neglect, and limited access to health care and mental health services, the level of unmet need for community-based support is extremely high. We need a caregiving workforce adequate to this need. 
Community health worker systems that are built on the model of what Paul Farmer called accompaniment have been shown to be highly effective at improving health while also substantially reducing healthcare costs. What makes accompaniment-based programs well-suited not just for improving public health but also for stopping cycles of violence and incarceration, building shared safety, and repairing communities is their bottom-up design, built on a frame, work of mutual aid in which the giving and receiving of care overlap, these community care systems succeed by prioritizing local knowledge and the employment of marginalized groups in caring for their own neighbors.